Okay, so you just shared about um, transforming a memory with your father and your mother, and it hits me in a very potent place because um, I think it was actually just this morning, so I kind of wonder if it's connected to you. I had this um, overwhelming gratitude pour over me for those people who are repairing the karma of their ancestral past and um, setting their parents free from um, the stories that held them. So um, your, your share is really potent because I really felt that on a very deep level this morning. Your people, I've heard say that the first 20 days of this year, there's this tremendous influx of cosmic healing. Yeah, this, uh, uh, the Mayan core days are happening right now. and I think we're in the 10th day, possibly. And this is a 20-day cycle. Yeah. Yeah, and so we're really going through some beautiful um, possibilities for rewriting. And so it feels a little bit like sewing to me because we're going through the stuff that's surfacing that no longer fits, and that's uncomfortable. And then we, as we release that, it kind of creates a vacuum, and then the new stories come in. So it feels like a little bit of a, a sewing these last... Uh, and plus, I think Venus is retrograde, which is a kind of a big deal to me. This feels like the most potent Venus retrograde. So I don't really follow astrology the way normal people do, but I feel the planets. And Venus is a pretty big um, energetic distinction for me. I can really feel her differently. And uh, I could really tell that she's working on me a lot lately as far as helping me get in touch with my yearnings and my grief and what's behind my grief. Um, it felt like this last year was really rough and I had to let go of a lot of my dreams of what I thought was going to happen. And uh, she's the, the Venus retrograde at the beginning of this year's really helped me let go at an easier pace and in it this depth of where my real yearning is which is this you know place of harmony and resonance with all of us so it's been working on me really well so just give me kind of a list a laundry list of where you are donating your time talent and treasure um well, right now, I'm really enjoying showing up on Sundays with Backup or the uh, group that's giving the free food out. And I would say, David, that that was um, all stemming from your idea of coming together and playing music, doing drumming. So I just want to thank you for um, putting your feelers out in that way and uh, coming up with inspirational ideas that then turn into networks of amazingness. Um, so yeah, there's the thing on Sunday. Uh, I feel like I have the blessing of having all my life be my service. And um, I don't generally think about making money like a job. I generally think about whatever I can do to help and then positioning myself to receive when it's when I need to receive something. So uh, right now I'm enjoying uh, working with a friend of mine who's working on permaculture projects in her property and I'm a uh, kind of living on the benevolence of others. There's uh, other friends that have um, property, so they both bought property about the same time, and I'm bebopping around. I'm not very good in the garden, but I'm good at people relations. 
So I get to do that, um, and I just listen for where I can be of service and try to show up. Um, the dream eventually is to do a traveling medicine show and with that be able to teach a little bit of my trade which is transmuting negative energy that's stored in the body through sound and music and toning so uh, I hope to be able to teach that more and really all my life is about whatever service feels like spirit would want to use me at and cheering people on and being a cheerleader is one of the biggest ways yeah. not a very concise answer but I get that no I get that well, how do you stay resilient what do you do when times get tough um, I feel like giving my gifts is the way that life generates exchange for me so feeling that I'm of service and offering uh, sound healing sessions or coaching or support in any way, even if someone can't afford it, somehow generates energy that then comes around to me getting what I need. So I usually communicate if I have missing something and say, hey, I'm kind of in need of this. And then people seem to network and say, you know, I would love to trade you a sound healing if you would like to do this. Or I would take this much money and then I go find a way to generate that. So it's a little bit different than a regular business, but it seems like the benevolence of others has been a gift for me. I had a... Um, spiritual awakening in 2010 and up until there then I was a workaholic really strong workaholic and uh, one of the realizations was to keep my energy exchange even and that if one person was taking more than the other it might look to traditional mindset that that person's getting more but in truth we're both wobbling in balanced and it's costing both of us in that role. So from there, I just started learning how to exchange in a way that my stomach didn't feel like I was giving too much or I didn't start having mind conversations saying, oh no, what about this or that? And started learning how to communicate when the exchange was off. And that turned into mir miracles for me. And I went from being an overworker and overstressor to finding a flow and a balance and a dance. And the people who needed my services showed up. And the people who had things to teach me showed up. And it became fun. It became fun. When you were a workaholic, were you working in a like a wage job? Yes, in fact, multiple wage jobs, and I've done lots of jobs. I kind of feel like this, that I have a gift of being a change agent, and when I drop into a place, I'm able to see what doesn't work, and as that surfaces, we work on fixing things, things get a little bit smoother, and then it's time for me to move. So that kind of happened on a regular basis in all the jobs I worked at before, and, Can you um, name some of those specific jobs? Sure. I was a doctor's assistant for seven years. And um, in that job, I entered every encounter that the doctor performed into his computer for over seven years. And it was amazing. I got to learn a lot about the human body and about medicines and sat and explained a lot. And, um, yeah, so that was really, really good. Uh, I was a pla worked at a plastics compounding company for quite a while. Worked at an air conditioning company. I did a lot of sales and loved sales. Um, really enjoyed that. I always had a secondary job as a waitress. Even if it was for a few hours, 
because I loved the service of just the simpleness of taking people's uh, food orders and then taking them the food and suggesting yummy mixtures because I love to mix food in certain ways and so that was really fun always did that always like no matter what else even whenever I had plenty of money I want to go have a little part-time waitressing job where I get to just serve people so yeah just lots of I would start off in a clerical position pretty low and then work my way up and then feel like okay this is more work than I want to do and or move or something and say something about this awakening in 2010 Tw yeah um, it was pretty beautiful I uh, was at an event and went to pray because there was a lot of energy around the event and pulled off to where there was a stream I had a couple friends with me and when I opened myself, my mouth to pray, instead, an ohm came out of my mouth that was so loud that while it was coming out, I was going, what in the heck is happening here? Asking myself that. And the my inner voice was, relax, this is fine. You know, you're, you're fine with this. This is not something scary. And so it just was this force, like, oh, 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 really, really loud, though, and it bounced off of the cavern and the water. And one of my friends had an out-of-body experience while it was happening, and he was going, oh, my God, like, I could think, I know what everyone's thinking. Oh, no. Got <laughs> <laughs> out a little, oh. And um, I went and told the other parts of the group were there because it was a pretty large event. And we all did an ohm together. And um, there was a music system behind us. And it jacked in to our voices. And we, like, did this ohm really loud and hit this really light place and then was quiet. And we all did this together and then came back down. And the stereo did it with it. So it was like the bro emergency broadcast system kind of a sound. And I was like, what the heck? So I went home and remembered a vision I had when I was 16 with the grid around the earth. And was feeling like, oh, something about those sounds was helping clear something. And then picked up an email that was random that was called Children of the Sun. It was talking about the grid around the earth. And I'm like, oh, this is really strange. I, this is something important here. And as I started reading it, she started talking about people getting activated that remembered that they were here to help. And at that point, I started going out every day and toning and clearing my body out and listening to the earth. And I lost 70 pounds in seven months. All my illnesses cleared up. And all this information came through. And it seemed like I would have stages of hearing different frequencies. So first it was the earth and it was really low. And then I started hearing like whales and dolphins and having to make strange sounds like that. And it was like two months that I was doing insect sounds and just going through all these different layers of sounds and understanding the frequencies and also feeling how it was moving in my body. And it wasn't until recently when I started watching trauma exercises that the polyvagal theory was ex exactly what they were describing within me. They were showing me that somehow the sound vibrates through the fascia and connects to the nerves and can clear blockages. So I started learning how to do that with people and it all felt related to angelic work. So I started invoking angels every time I did anything and I'm, I'm amazed. I'm amazed.
I'm amazed at the beauty of how things work. I'm amazed that at a higher frequency things can transmute and turn to love and that it's all love. And that the lower frequencies are fear of receiving love. But it's still all love. Um, life is incredible once it's past my story. Once it's something I feel. Rather than something in my head. And so the awakening just helped me appreciate present moment present moment connection and how healing just being present to each other is hello there <laughs> what a, uh, I don't know if any of that's useful but uh, so tell me about your experience with homelessness as it's conventionally defined when I had my awakening, um, I heard my inside voice, which I believed was a future self kind of um, guidance. So I would say I heard my guide tell me to leave home. And I argued with it for a while. I was like, no. And the economy had dropped down in Houston and it wasn't able to make very much money. So I was kind of struggling. And it kept saying, leave home, leave home, connect to the Indigo Kids. And I didn't know who the Indigo Kids were, so I had to go look that up. I was like, Indigo Girl Band, I don't know, Indigo. And looked up Indigo Kids and was like, oh, my son's an Indigo Kid. Which, uh, at the time, my son was hoboing and uh, had just started playing banjo and hopping trains and... So I was like, oh, like him, I understand. And they were saying, leave home, connect to the Indigo Kids, go to the Rainbow Gathering. And I was arguing about that, like some hippie festival for a week, and I'm supposed to leave home for this? I don't think so. And um, then Banjo came home, my son, and said, hey, Mom, why are you struggling? You should hit the road. Why don't you come to the Rainbow Gathering with me? And as soon as he said that, I knew I had to. So I got rid of everything, and I, the voice was saying, if you can't carry it on your back, it owns you. And my family was saying, you're crazy to leave home with your hobo son. But I did it anyway, and so I became homeless. And I just trusted. What, what year was that? That was in 2011. Oh. So my uh, my son was... You know, tell, told me, don't even take your car. If you take your car, you'll end up driving people around. Trust the universe to take you. And I thought that was brilliant because I was a workaholic and worried about everybody else and wanted to provide. And this way, I could actually just let go and be provided for. So it was a backpack with my clothes and my memory foam pillow and um, trust and... I enjoy, he, my son called it home free, and I went to the rainbow gathering, and then I hitchhiked, and then I ended up in Taos, New Mexico, where a girlfriend of mine was like, you can't be homeless in my hometown. I don't want to see you in the, the food lines here. And so she bought me a ticket and said, you can go anywhere you want to. And I ended up uh, going to... Um, uh, someplace outside of Ashland and volunteering and staying there and then moved here and couch surfed with a good friend of mine and from there just moved on so as I did that going to the food lines and meeting the homeless people I realized that there wasn't that much of a difference okay so you're in your 50s now I'm 56 yeah so yeah, oh. so traveling and, and being homeless really helped me love um, what was going on out there. Like noticing that people weren't able to maintain. I mean, I was working three jobs, 
you know, I wasn't doing that well. So then noticing other people and people who couldn't handle it and how we weren't that much different. And a lot of the people that are out there are sensitives and they're home, they're self-medicating and they're dealing and coping and the weight of coping mechanism versus being able to stay on top, and especially in places that are more oppressed, just made me appreciate that everybody on every level is doing something. You know, they're doing their work. Even those that are doing dark work are doing the work. We're all having to play a role in this bogged down system and appreciating the role that those who are suffering are playing in this bogged down system as we learn to do something different. So what is that role, the, the suffering? Well, definitely we have to see that what the, the capitalist system isn't working and some people are going to be the ones that fall through the cracks. And they are the sensitives. You know, um, when I left home and I was hearing about the rainbow, I mean the indigo kids, looking around I was like, this is definitely a different type of person. Banjo is a different type of person. He's tried the 8 to 5. It tears his heart out. He can't do it. And watching them, you know, we traveled for a year after that from in 2011 and 2012. And that was amazing to travel a year with him in a caravan. Just go around and play music and uh, work with people. And these were all street people. And a lot of them rainbow kids. And I was like, wow, there's so many families out there who don't understand why their children can't do an eight to five or why they can't learn the same way. And I'm grateful I understand. I'm grateful to see these kids when we pull into a park, scatter and grab resources and wildcraft and build structures and catch a things on fire. I'm like, if I am at a place where the system doesn't work, I want to be around these guys because they get it. But they sure don't look like they belong in the society that we grew up in. So yeah, they're in the cracks, but they're showing me a completely different way of being. And I think that gap has to happen. So I thank them for the role of teaching us being our teachers. So I've been seeing reports for several months now of millions of people quitting their jobs. Yeah. Do you think that's related to what you just said? Yeah. I really don't think we can continue, keep, keep going in this, you know, how many baristas do we need? How many Taco Bells do we need in a city? We're not going to be able to keep this up. And I think instinctively we're feeling that, especially after being given a pause. You know, I pulled out of the system before the COVID thing hit, but watching the COVID thing hit, I mean, I kind of felt, I could sense with the energies and the, the predictions that were coming through my system that things were going to get bogged down and really have to change. I was, I'm always feeling that nature or divine guidance or the great mystery or the Holy Spirit, however you want to put it, God has the most compassionate way, really. And if I look at the COVID pushing us back into our little things and still, even though we're facing all kinds of ideas about separation, still feeling like we're all in it together in some way. I'm like, that's probably more compassionate of a way for us to 
come into a different pace, a pace that's slower and more deliberately connected to our yards, our homes, our families. So yeah, I think it's all that cycle, right? We're all in that cycle right now. And I'm grateful that it's happening the way it is, even though some people are like, oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I kind of ramble with my answers, so. No, but it's good stuff. Um, okay, so one of the things that's been on my mind is the people that are trying to help the people that are suffering. And in the process, getting burnt out. Yeah. And I think you know some same people I know. Yeah. What would you say to those people? I think I would not say anything to the people who were burnt out, except for maybe that idea about balancing the exchange. And when you start to feel it in your heart or your belly or your head or your start telling stories about who's doing what, that it's time to step back a little bit. Or maybe in time to put yourself in receiving position. It's not about the people who are burnt out. I think we can't help but feel the effect if our, we have open hearts of what's going on. I think it's a matter of getting more people involved so we can play tag team. That was gonna be my next question. How can we get more people out there helping, volunteering, like two housed people for every one house, unhoused person? Yeah, you know, when I first was, like a few years ago, I was so excited being here. And especially Eugene. You know, there's so many healers. It was a little bit like, you know, being tapped on the shoulder by an angel and saying, go here. I'm going blindly there, and all of a sudden I see all these people doing the same thing I'm doing. And, I mean, I don't know how many sound healers there are and other kinds of healers and spiritual people. So I was looking around going, oh, my gosh, if we all, like, took a little bit of time and the Occupy thing was happening, I was like, if we all took a little bit of time and took shifts, we could probably have the healthiest city in the country. You know, it, it was Occupy Medical had come out, and I was like, I could just imagine when people are going to get um, health services, us taking turns going down there and helping out. And when I talked to people, they'd look at me like I was crazy. It was like the timing wasn't right. You know, like, good luck with that. Well, how are you going to make money? Already it sounded goofy and, like, high in the sky how I was making money. Right? Like, people be just like, how are you making it on the benevolence of others? No, that didn't sound right to most people. <laughs> you know? So, like, trying to get people to step out of that place. And then the COVID came and the mass stuff. But now it actually feels like we're close to that time somehow. And I don't really know what that is. But my answer is that the way to get more of us out there is for us to have fun. For us to enjoy each other. You know, for us to play together. For us to connect. Make it attractive. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it is attractive when there's actual connection. When there's fear in the eyes of those that we're trying to connect to, it's a little bit harder. But after a while, they relax. So consistency in showing up and being authentic, for sure, is huge. And not coming from a place of, I'm better, let me come help you for a few hours. But more like, hello, human being who's doing your work out here, here. I'm a human being doing my work out there, there. And now we're meeting here in this place. You know, so I think that's important instead of some kind of attitude of being better than, which I don't think is true. Um, you know, I think most of the people who are burnt out are people who also know that that's not true and that's part of why it hurts. 
is you're seeing people, divine human beings, suffering. But, um, yeah, more of us reaching out, I think, is the answer. And loving it. More of us who authentically love it. And for those who aren't made out to do this work, to give with money or other resources, clear out their closets, you know, every little bit goes around. So I think it's more of open heart connection and loving that we're getting to do open heart connection together. Yeah, you're saying some same things Roger was talking about with me. Yeah. Just show up. Yeah. Consistently. Yeah. Build trust. Yeah. Treat people like human beings. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you can see it in the people who are doing it, too. You can see it in their eyes. You know, Banjo, Roger, Timothy, you. You can see it. It's infectious. I mean, when I met Timothy, you introduced me to Timothy. It was like, oh, this is family. They're doing the same thing. They're being driven to come out here and do this. And it's about people connecting to people. The money, I mean, the food is one of the ways. But this is really about the connection more than the food. Because that's what heals. Yeah. I mean, food heals too. I can't say that. That's not true. Yeah. It's about healing. Yeah. And, you know, me, really, as I, as I connect, I heal. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I found it to be true. Just uh, even healing at a distance. Yeah. I do the Sufi healing ceremony. And I come out of it feeling more whole. Yeah. Do you do that on Sundays? Uh, no. I okay. do a Friday one with Isa, and I do a Wednesday one with Debbie Tide. Awesome. I like those. Uh, there are other ones. I know the one on Sunday. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, to me, it's like light, isn't it? This is about filling with light and then sharing the light. Filling love. with light and sharing the light. It's love. Yeah. Yeah. Love. Yeah. And... Without words. Yes. You don't have to say something like, I love you, to somebody else. They get it. Right. They know. I mean, it's like... <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, when I was first... Oh. My favorite definition of love is when consciousness recognizes itself in another. Yes. Yes. You know, it's like... I am you, you are me, uh, there's, there's nothing in here between us, right. there's nothing. The, kind of one of the ways that I saw it was um, that my Sushumna or life channel is made of this resonant material that when it comes into contact with anything else, it changes. So my sense of identity, if I remember that it's flexible and always changing, because of course I'm divine and wouldn't want to stop experiencing. If then I feel and realize what each person is waking up in me, what flavor I'm taking on that's new that I wouldn't have felt had I not met them. It's like their frequency signature that's made up of the recipe of who they are and what they've been touched by touches my frequency signature, the flavor that I'm, my heart is resonating at. And we're, we change by each other. And I'm either changing and expanding and feeling more of that flavor, or I'm hitting up against someone who makes me want to contract. And then I'm like, oh, my identity says, I'm not you. So now you're something I'm judging is not me. And what's the opportunity here, right? How can I 
work with this place where we've interconnected that wants to be constrictive. And it's just kind of like this, I feel like I'm a flavor collector or a color collector, only it's a people collector. Like each time I reach up against someone, I'm getting colored or flavored by who they are. And it feels like really I'm just this little human opening that's coming with more and more flavors of who I am as I grow older and older. So I better not get stuck onto thinking I am a specific thing for too long or it's going to hurt. <laughs> That's what it feels like. <laughs> I think one of the attractions to me to doing these interviews is this is my way of collecting yeah. another flavor. Yeah. Because everyone's different. Yeah. It's just amazing. Yeah. And, uh, but circling back to what you said about having fun with it, uh, uh, back in the 70s in this mystical school of Eureka, they were talking about how change is not gradual, it's radical. It happens in jumps. Yeah, dynamic shifts. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. Disjunctive evolution or something it's been called. Yeah. But it always moves by attraction. No, pr no pressure. Yes. Just, whoa, that looks like someplace I want to go. Right. Some, someplace Expansive, I want to be. exciting, like, flavor. Right. Yeah. yeah. Or charge. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can bring it down to physics. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and well, or you can talk about frequencies. Right. You know, like, I want to go to a higher frequency. Yeah, frequency is my favorite way of do, talking about it because it's just my brain thinks that way after all those deals. But, yeah, yeah. after all, all those transmissions of different frequencies, right, right, right. it's like that. that's the language that's easiest for me to speak about it in. But... Yeah. I love listening and sharing in this language of what's happening right now. Yeah. It's, right? Like, wow. Me too. Of course, that's how we got to be here, you and me. When I first got to uh, to Oregon, I uh, was I left home out of an inspiration that was spiritually motivated, knowing that life was going to start needing this. Uh, Banjo, who's my son, uh, was already out in the world doing the Occupy stuff and he came home and I was hearing messages saying leave home and he said, Mom, why don't you leave home with me? And um, when he started speaking the same thing that was in my prayers, I was like, okay, I have to go. So knowing that many people will probably lose a lot of what's important to them. It felt important to let myself go through that process of letting go of everything and taking a leap. And it wasn't that much of a leap because my son was also doing it and even if he wasn't traveling with me, he was a phone call away and a banjo, what do I do now? Which was great help. But when I got here to Oregon, I volunteered at a place that had a plaque and that plaque was a quote from, uh, I believe, a Native American uh, background that said, true safety lies only in community. And it went through me so strongly because I could have everything I want in my storehouse, in my barn, in my home, but without community, it could be wiped out in a moment. I could have all the health that I want and be really vital and then one really strong illness come along and all, all of a sudden I'm not safe again. But if I'm cultivating the relationships and the community around me, then when things happen, I have family. I have people to watch out for myself. And the same goes for me to be able to do that for others. So that felt really in alignment with what we already stood for and why we decided to leave home and take this out in the first place. 
and to me it's about being able to bridge the collapsing world out there with acts of kindness and love compassion spreading peace while working on skills of interrelational building and communication um, support um, right now you know starting with Occupy and even before that we could see that there was some corruption or some um, I'd say deterioration in the systems and knowing that this time is coming we decided to be a part of that force to um, bridge that gap as these systems are falling so this uh, volunteer work that we do with the community center fits perfectly with that because we're able to support people who are in need uh, hopefully empower a environment of community support together uh, helping with resilience helping fill needs that aren't being met fully by the system. So, you know, that was an inspiring question for me about where are the men. Um, and the things that I've watched, you know, that, that I've been participated in, I see, first of all, that I believe the culture and how sustainable the culture is depends on how much we're letting each other know how much we appreciate each other. And I think traditionally speaking, women have not gotten as much acknowledgement as far as status acknowledgement when they go out and do things. They're moms, they're handling the stuff that most people don't even notice or think. So they're kind of used to just getting out there and doing it without getting the, the kudos for doing it. Um, they're just fulfilling the need for the whole. I believe that the old paradigm is kind of based on a reward system or a status or hierarchy system. And they're, you know, like in military and in corporations, there's these, you know, steps that you climb and there's acknowledgement that you get. And one of the things I notice is that if there's power dynamics going on, and men don't feel appreciated, they might not show up as much. They might actually feel frustrated about not being recognized. Um, and if there's not strong male role models, I believe Banjo is a st strong male role model. I believe that you and I witnessed other strong male role models whose leadership makes people feel like they want to, want to jump in and help. And when that happens, it looks like lots of men show up. And I think it doesn't take that many men that are doing it and getting most of the recognition for the other men to kind of thin out. I feel like if they're not getting some gratitude back or something like that, they kind of get watered down or frustrated. And then the power dynamics show up. So I believe that... For me, there's no shortage of men showing up. There are tons of men showing up in my life wanting to be of service. If I can let them know that I appreciate them, give them easy things to do, they want to jump in. Um, and I think that one of the biggest, you know, this is crazy because it's gender based and I feel a little bit awkward talking about gender based in that way, but I also want to say that most of the men that help love it when a happy woman or happy people say thank you. And most of the men also like it when they have pretty clear guidelines of what is needed. I also appreciate the men that are peripheral watchers and kind of walk around the edges and make sure things are safe or anchor the space, which um, that's a type of anchoring, but also anchor the space as far as like setting things up and making sure that the structure's handled. And if they're no, if they know they're appreciated, I believe they'll show up. If they know they're needed. I believe they'll show up. I also believe that 
if they're not being shown that they're appreciated, they'll get frustrated or they'll vie for position if there's somebody taking all the credit. So that's my feedback on that question. What's your skill set, Charlie? So mine is uh, healing, healing work, um, trauma consciousness, um, supporting uh, people in and groups in seeing where there might be possible energy leaks and solutions for how to possibly reclaim more of that power and energy. Um, yeah, so it's more like meta thinking. I'm pretty good at the meta thinking deal and patterns and pulling that together. I also am uh, really strong with the spiritual world and appreciate the uh, connection to the elementals and to the spirit guides and angels and use them in almost everything that I do. So how would you uh, put that out there as your mission statement? Um, well, my mission statement is uh, to uh, bring in the codes of enlightenment and into the new earth energy uh, to help people transmute any kind of energies that no longer are serving them and to support the community and being uh, uh, more supportive to each other. So when there's conflict, good conflict resolution, that type of thing. And of course, silliness. <laughs> <laughs> we all have in common. Yeah.